You are about to see the men and women of the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office working at their task of making our community safer. You will also see the stories of crimes that have been committed. We are looking for these subjects. They are Jefferson's Most Wanted. When the men and women of the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office go on watch to protect and serve the citizens of our parish, the risks they face can be deadly and the margin for error small. Some of our officers fall in a line of duty. Their watch ended before their time. We honor these men and women on the anniversary of their final watch. Sergeant Louis Canaliato was shot and killed on May 5, 1965 as he responded to a disturbance call in West Wigo, Louisiana. When the units arrived, the shooter opened fire with a fully loaded 12-gauge shotgun. Sergeant Canaliato was struck in the head. The suspect was shot and killed by other responding officers. Sergeant Canaliato and another officer were rushed to the hospital where he succumbed to his wounds. The use of a weapon in an armed robbery greatly increases the likelihood of harm to the victim and to bystanders. When the robber is a felon, Danger multiplies because incarceration has not modified dangerous behavior. On May 21, 2017, at approximately 8.52 p.m., a suspect entered a gas station in the 400 block of Berman Highway in Terrytown, Louisiana, armed with a handgun. The suspect, later identified as Clayton Wilson, a black male, 38 years of age, demanded money from the register. The clerk gave him the money as he demanded, and the subject fled on foot. Clayton Wilson is wanted by the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office on the charge of armed robbery and is a convicted felon in possession of a firearm. Anyone known of the location of Clayton Wilson is asked to contact Crime Stoppers at 822-1111 or Detective Mark Macaluso with the JPSO robbery section at 364-5300. The Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office, along with most law enforcement agencies, want you to know that there are new regulations that strengthen penalties for driving while intoxicated. Refusing the breathalyzer test can result in the suspension of your driver's license for 180 days to one year for a first offense, and from 18 months to two years for a second offense. Visit the state police website and click on statewide news releases for the latest on the rules and enforcement. Sometimes burglars are armed during the commission of their crime. There are two such persons in the next story. These suspects have not only committed a criminal act, they have also violated the sense of safety we were all entitled to have. The identity of one of them is unknown at this time. We have the name of the second suspect and we ask your help in locating him. On April 18, 2017, at approximately 2 a.m., Hendrick Porter, a black male, 21 years of age, and an unknown black male entered a residence in the 1400 block of South Meadow Street through an unlocked front door. Both subjects were armed with handguns. While the unknown black male held the occupants in a rear bedroom, Porter went through the residence and stole over $1,000 in cash, a cell phone, and a 32 caliber handgun. Both subjects then departed the residence. While the first subject remains unknown at this time, Hedrick Porter is wanted by the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office on charges of aggravated burglary and use of a dangerous weapon. Anyone knowing the location of Hedrick Porter or the identity of the unknown black male is asked to contact Crime Stoppers at 822-1111 or Detective Wayne Aguilar with the JPSO burglary section at 364-5300. It is the desire of our community that the Jefferson Parish be a safe place to live, work, and raise a family. Crucial to this is the idea the home is the safe place we want it to be. You can protect yourself by locking the doors of your home and your vehicle. We we're coming up on the anniversary of the death of uh, Deputy Michelle, and I believe uh, Deputy Steve Arnold is still fighting uh, after his uh, shooting. So it was probably an appropriate time recently to have National Police Week 
And that's a nice memorial in uh, Washington, D.C. You visited that, didn't you? Yes, I went this year. It's my first year uh, attending. Uh, it was an, an incredible experience in the memory of so many fallen officers that have made the ultimate sacrifice uh, to their country and to their community. Um, the candlelight vigil on Saturday night was overwhelming. Over 25,000 people attended um, on, uh, on, you know, there on the, uh, in, in D.C. And then on Monday, on, on the grounds of the Capitol on the West Lawn, uh, we had yet another ceremony. Uh, President Trump spoke and uh, actually came down into the audience and um, took pictures and shook hands with the families of the fallen officers, which I thought was a, a really nice touch. Um, obviously, uh, when you go, you wish you didn't have a reason to go. Yeah. Um, having said that, though, uh, it is a beautiful monument. Uh, where they're now developing a museum as well uh, in the memory of so many uh, heroes uh, that courageously fought the fight uh, and made the ultimate sacrifice. People don't realize how important those kind of ceremonies are. I was recently at a, a funeral of a deceased firefighter and firefighters, they take care of their own and they had a lovely little ceremony which uh, his son appreciated enormously. You can't say how much. And, of course, everybody was choked up watching the son, watching the father be honored. Right. Yeah, you know, and, and it's very important. And in the case of Stephen Arnold, uh, you know, Stephen still is, is fighting for his life. Uh, in fact, I, I met with some donors just yesterday uh, that had called and had been interacting and, you know, made a contribution uh, to help cover uh, some of his medical expenses that are not covered by uh, medical insurance. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the officers that are uh, seriously and significantly injured, uh, like Jerome Fountain, uh, as well as Stephen Arnold, um, you know, they, they don't uh, get the recognition uh, as much, and their lives are, are completely altered forever. Oh, yeah. Um, and so I always try to remind folks about keeping uh, both uh, Jerome and Stephen in their prayers uh, each and every day. Well, let's change the subject, um, not to a happier one, but in the news lately there's been an awful lot of talk about prison reform, and I figure if anybody knows anything on the subject, it's probably going to be you. Well, I think, you know, it's a, a little broader subject is criminal justice reform okay. uh, and prison obviously being uh, one of them and, and the sentences and whether or not they should be a re-engineering and a right-sizing of sentencing um, in not only the state of Louisiana but across the country. And this is something that you've seen uh, move across the country. I do believe that there's a place for criminal justice reform. Um, I think that we have to have appropriate sentences. Uh, the cost of incarceration is expensive, but having said that, the cost of alternatives to incarceration are equally expensive. So we look with bated breath as to the evidence-based outcomes of programs that are implemented to try and reduce the recidivism rate. Um, I think the jury's still out uh, in large part uh, as to the effectiveness and efficacy of these programs, but I think it's worth looking at because the incarceration model uh, is not yielding the results that we necessarily need it to do as it relates to recidivism. Uh, and that's, you know, to stop folks from reoffending again. We either have to provide more services while incarcerated or we do it kind of outpatient, meaning, you know, day reporting centers or whatever it may be, uh, that we move folks, a lot of them with addictive disorders, off of their addiction because that's what's driving a lot of their um, offender behavior. Um, and, and look at these things in a very realistic way and to gain a better understanding of what is going to be the best path for us to travel. 
uh, here. You know, a lot of folks say, oh, you're soft on crime because you look at that. No, it's more being smart on crime and trying to figure out what's actually going to work. And, you know, just l to lock folks up isn't always the answer. Uh, we need to con constantly and meaningfully look at this over and over and over again. It's not something that we should revisit once every 20 years. It's something that we should be looking at uh, consistently and constantly uh, to make sure that the dollar that we're spending is being used in the most effective way. Yeah, I'm not a numbers man, but I ran, ran across recently the amount of money it takes to keep someone in prison, which is, you know, awful lot. And then I've read, too, that the number of people in prison, a lot of them are there for relatively, you know, minor crimes. And then fear of going back causes someone who's about to be arrested to do some very stupid things. Yeah, you know, it's a very dangerous jambalaya. I don't like to refer to um, and, cat and characterize offenders based on the instant charge in which they're serving time for because that's not the complete picture of the offender. And I think that's why we get caught up sometimes where we lose sight of what we're trying to accomplish because we're carving out geography and we want to call this that and call that that. And we're not uh, reaching consensus or compromise on issues. A criminal is not made by the violation of one statute on one yeah. day and one conviction. You need to look at the individual in their totality as to whether or not they have been an, uh, a criminal justice impact offender and have really degraded the quality of life in a community by virtue of, of their conduct. Uh, they may be in for possession of marijuana, but they also may yeah. have 25 armed robbery arrests and you know they've been a significant player for a long time. Just because we've only convicted them on the marijuana does not mean that that offender is a nonviolent offender. Good point. Um, I was reading recently, and I just wanted to talk to you briefly about it because it seems like almost textbook case. Uh, this happened about six months ago. Uh, someone committed a robbery, and they didn't know who he was, and they lifted DNA off the cash register. <laughs> And were able to identify him through that. And then I think through the CIC, the Criminal Intelligence Center, they uh, got information from Orleans. And through all of these different means, we were able to narrow down where he might be. And, and he was arrested. Cooperation and forensic science, that's where we're going these days. Well, you've often heard me say that you have to deploy technology in a meaningful way. You have to weave it into your organization operationally so that you can avail yourself and access that technology relatively seamlessly and easily. Uh, and we, I spend a lot of time making sure that that's what we do um, so that it's almost second nature, that it's going to happen. And so when we get touch DNA or we... we we, we are getting information through the CIC. These are the tools that we've weaved into our organization operationally that we rely on every day. And there's a plethora of them that are out there. Uh, and we spend a lot of time educating our employees on how to access these tools in a meaningful way to help facilitate their investigations. But in the end, it has to be uh, an investigator who draws it all together and Abs says that's it. Ab absolutely. You've got to have the tools working for you as opposed to you working for them. But you still need the experience and the intelligence. Absolutely. Thank you for a few minutes of your time, Sheriff. Thank you.
Relationships may sometimes result in misunderstandings that must be resolved. If a relationship is broken beyond repair, the wise thing is to start again. Violence is never the answer, and threats, whether made in person or over an electronic device, are equally a violation of the law. On May 16, 2017, the Sheriff's Office investigated the battery and physical and obscene threats made against the victim by her ex-boyfriend, Paul Cotoli, a white male, 37 years of age, is wanted by the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office on charges of simple battery, obscene talk on the telephone, and cyberstalking. Anyone knowing the location of Paul Cotoli is asked to contact Crime Stoppers at 822-1111 or Detective Kelly Crone with the JPSO Personal Violence Section at 364-5300. James E. Smith, a white male, 5'6 in height, weighing 160 pounds with brown hair and hazel eyes, was reportedly missing from his residence in the 2200 block of North Friendship Drive in Harvey, Louisiana, on September 6, 1991. At the time of his disappearance, he was 21 years of age. He had left home to attend classes at UNO. Friends reported seeing him on the campus that day, but no further information about his disappearance has been discovered during the investigation. If you have information about him, contact Lieutenant Tim Murphy of the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office Missing Persons Unit at 364-5300. We cannot remind you too often to lock the doors of your vehicle when you leave. An unlocked vehicle is an invitation to a criminal. On April 28, 2017, at approximately 9 a.m., the unknown black male burglarized several vehicles in the parking lot of a business in the 100 block of Labar Road in Metairie, Louisiana. The property inside those vehicles was stolen. The unknown black male seen in the surveillance video was driving a small black sedan, which is also seen in the video. Approximately one hour later, the suspect used a stolen credit card belonging to one of the victims at the GameStop located in the 2700 block of Veterans Highway. Anyone knowing the identity of this suspect and or the location of the vehicle shown is asked to contact Crime Stoppers at 822-1111 or Lieutenant Colotri with the JPSO burglary section at 364-5300. The information age has led to faster and more efficient ways of communicating. It also provides means of interacting with each other none of us could imagine a few years ago. Social media has replaced more traditional means of sharing news, thoughts, and feelings in an interactive platform. For that reason, the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office has established a Facebook page and we invite you to examine it. Will Callenborn has been tasked with instituting and maintaining our page and we talk to him about it. Let's start off with what is social media? Now that may sound like a dumb question, but let's start there. Sure. Well, for us right now, social media is uh, primarily Facebook, which is a, a website where you know people have accounts and they share personal information. And a lot of people think it's just a place for, you know, post pictures from your vacation or talk to old friends. But uh, what we use it for and what a lot of companies are using it for these days is a, a platform to communicate with uh, the people that we serve, which is, you know, the people of Jefferson Parish. And uh, it's really a great tool for communicating with people, opening avenues of conversation with people, and uh, sharing things about us that people normally would never get to see. Um, but we post quite frequently on there. We uh, you know, have a, a lot of things going on in the sheriff's office. And social media is a really great tool to show people stuff that you know, they might have not seen otherwise. How, how much, uh, what kind of feedback do you get? How much uh, is it being utilized? Uh, so we, on average, uh, I think uh, probably around 100,000 people see our stuff per week. And, uh, 100,000? Oh yeah, yeah, we can definitely. And sometimes we'll tick up into even higher numbers, something like you know, gets shared a lot or something is just, you know, really uh, an important story. Uh, but yeah, we, we have a lot of people uh, that see our stuff on Facebook. Some people don't realize how, how much reach you can get. No, I think a lot of people are, are completely unaware of uh, what Facebook can do, which mm -hmm. is why people post some of the things they post, <laughs> exactly, which yeah. is not yeah. necessarily a good idea. Uh -huh. um, I heard this or was told this, I don't remember, but conversation is disappearing and posting on Facebook and other sites like it is becoming our primary means of communication. 
some people live on social media. I mean, they have their whole, almost their whole lives on social media. It's uh, it's kind of it's, even to me, it's crazy. Uh, but uh, yeah, a lot of people s spend their whole day on there. They'll tell you what they're having for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you can just follow their entire day. Uh, it's kind of uh, insane to see, which is uh, interesting because I mean, as it turns out, uh, people are on it so much. A lot of our uh, detectives use social media to solve crimes. They can solve an entire crime just by like researching on somebody that they're looking into. We were able to, one of the things I'm you know, most proud about with my work there is working with the missing uh, persons detectives. We started a program for them where we're sharing uh, missing persons posters digitally on a much faster l way than they've ever been able to do it. Uh, and I think so, so far they've found seven or eight people from uh, information that they got from Facebook. Do we use Twitter hours. at all? Uh, we haven't yet. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a lot of people are in your situation. A lot of people working at the sheriff's office are in your situation. They don't really know what it does. So I've kind of had, to, I'm in the process of kind of explaining the purposes of all these different things because I think, you know, the main three would probably be Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram right now. Uh, Wait, what was the third one? Instagram. It's a, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's I'm, a, I'm afraid of that. <laughs> it's terrifying. Uh, but those are probably the main three that people use right now. And we're kind of in the process of figuring out how we want to use those things uh, for ourselves, you know, how we can best utilize those tools to communicate with people. So we're working on an Instagram next, uh, but kind of been, you know, talking with people about how, how they want to use it, the kind of things that they want to share out there. And then Twitter will be after that sometime. But we wanted to start with Facebook, you know, just to get set in, figure out how we wanted to have the whole thing work. The Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office prides ourselves on responding quickly to a call for help. For that reason, we are constantly upgrading our equipment and personnel. The fastest way to call for help is through 911. If you call, we will be there. We visited recently to talk to the center's commander, Major Ron Hofell. We serve as all unincorporated Jefferson Parish and a few municipalities, West Wego, Harahan, Grand Isle Nail, and um, Jean Lafitte. All um, 911 calls that come into the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office are answered by a Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office employee designated as a call taker. The call taker will take that information from the person, from the complainant enter it into a computer-aided dispatch system, and then and through the computer, it's routed to the appropriate dispatcher. And then for the sheriff's office side, the responsibility for dispatching is for law enforcement as well as EMS. And if it's for fire, and it's a fire-related incident that needs to be dispatched, then the East Bank Consolidated Fire Department personnel dispatchers will dispatch that to their units. The operator is, is taught and is trained to take control of that telephone call the most important thing is to find out the location. The location is, is what we need to be able to send services to, to that person. Once they get the location and they can, they can determine what, the, what type of incident is taking place, then they can get that information, put it into the system, and send it to the dispatcher. And if the call is hysterical, I mean, it's a, it's a very traumatic experience that they're going through at that time and, and, and that period of their life, the operator may not be able to get as much information. Sometimes they can get a lot. It's, uh, it depends on how, how well they control their call. And there's questions we ask for reasons that we want to provide to the responders on the street so they can process the call through their head and how they're going to handle it before they get on scene. And multitasking is a is, is tremendous um, asset that a person has to have is to be able to take the information that's being given to them over the phone, enter it into, and simultaneously enter it into the system and getting it to the dispatcher. So they'll go through several months of training as a, uh, as a call taker, and then eventually they'll move on to uh, training for, as a dispatcher, whether it's on the law enforcement side and then uh, the EMS side as well. We cross-train all employees, so we'll have a very well-diverse group of employees. Somebody who can, who can who can be very diplomatic and take charge of that call um, and, and not let the person just go um, tell us information that's really not relative to what's going on. Um, but somebody who's empathetic can listen to and, and has the ability to get that information and get it out in a timely fashion. Uh, we have three levels of supervision. A watch commander, who is the, uh, the, the uh, top of the list, 
the supervisor, and then the assistant supervisor. And the three of them oversee the, the call takers and dispatchers under their command, as well as our, our NCIC operators, and those are the ones who operate our National Crime Information Center database, where they do criminal history checks and, um, for wanted persons or stolen vehicles, and they also make entries into that. The turnover can be, um, can be high, and we find that it's not only us that are affected by it locally, but it's nationwide. Um, a lot of times you, 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 you get people who, who pass the hiring process, they, they get through all their training, and then um, they'll realize that this just really isn't for them. Because we're dealing with life and death, real life situations every day, and it, it, it can take a toll on them. On a daily basis, the day watch will probably see on the average between 900 to 1,000 calls. Maybe 11, sometimes it'll break 1,100. And then on the night shift, it'll be somewhere else between 7 to 800 calls during a 12 hour period. The Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office works every day to keep our streets safe. To be effective, we need citizens as committed as we are. Here are the images of persons who are currently Jefferson's most wanted. Attention, Clayton Wilson, a black male, 38 years of age, is wanted by the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office on charges of armed robbery and as a convicted felon in possession of a firearm. The suspect entered a gas station on Berman Highway armed with a handgun, demanding money from the register. Receiving the money, he fled. Anyone knowing the location of Wilson is asked to contact Crime Stoppers or Detective Mark Macaluso with the JPSO robbery section at 364-5300. Attention, Hendrick Porter, a black male, 21 years of age, is wanted by the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office on the charges of aggravated burglary and use of a dangerous weapon for entering an unlocked residence armed with a handgun, stealing over $1,000 in cash, a cell phone, and a 32 caliber handgun. Anyone knowing the location of Hendrick Porter is asked to contact Crime Stoppers or Detective Wayne Aguilard with the JPSO burglary section at 364-5300.